Hello and welcome to The Goggle, where we challenge and if necessary, destroy media narratives. I'm Peter Lavelle. Uh, China is always top of mind now. If it's if it's not China, it's Russiagate, and they seem to go uh, back and forth here. And with the election coming up, China is getting more and more um, airtime, mostly because uh, the Trump administration it likes to demonstrate that it's tough on China here. But there's a lot of different voices out there, but they all tend to just converge here about the nature of China and its foreign policy and its it's it's attempts to influence particularly american politics to talk about this we have phil giraldi is a former cia counterterrorism uh specialist and we have george samuli of course co-founder of the gaggle here you, you know phil i was watching fox news um this morning which means it was a program uh, yesterday in the u.s and um the kind of rhetoric coming out on china China steals our technology, intellectual property. It's interfering in our elections. It's uh, um, uh, it's it's acting as a rogue actor, influencing politics. Yeah, that's all true. I, I I'm not going to disagree with that at all. Okay, but the U.S. does it also all the time, all around the world. Um, China's doing what the U.S. does, but no one has any kind of introspection and how you no know, introspection to realize that and maybe not the kind of imagination to learn how to push back. I mean, we did survive the Cold War, Phil. Yeah, well, you know, uh, my perspective is that uh, from what I've been reading, I've, I have visited China a couple of times and uh, uh, China is uh, a place that really surprises you. Uh, you go there and you have uh, certain uh, preconceptions about uh, it's a police state. It's a totalitarian, and and, and um, uh, things happen that uh, that tell you that, no, it's not quite that simple. And uh, the Chinese government, for example, uh, which we portray in a certain terms, is uh, is very popular in China. So obviously they're doing something right. Now I think China is um, uh, an economic imperialist country. What I mean by that is they're following the same examples that the British Empire followed in the 19th century uh, and 18th and 19th century and the U.S. Uh, subsequently, where economic power translates into political power. And um, the way you keep expanding your economic power is to expand physically in terms of markets and places that you have relationships with. I see China doing that. And uh, the difference is that the American political class needs an enemy. It always needs an enemy. And uh, China is being framed very much as a threat, uh, as a as a military threat to the United States and to U.S. allies. And I just don't see that. I think that we have we have two very separate issues here. China is very aggressive in marketing its products in in uh, manufacturing new things and yeah, and stealing technologies and stuff like that. And uh, you know things that. There's always a downside to every plus side, but I, I do not yeah, buy I, into I agree that. with that, but at the same time, um, great powers do not take kindly to uh, being supplanted by emerging powers. Um, certainly, uh, the British didn't take kindly to Germany uh, supplanting it at the end of the 19th century. Look we know where, where that led. Sparta. <laughs> uh, and this is what's happening today. So the United States has since, uh, since certainly 1945 has been the dominant economic power uh, in the world. I mean, it, it has its dollar, the reserve currency. Um, it has um, its uh, Europe, you know, it's, it's essentially it's kind of ally, military ally that it can uh, wield as it chooses. So it's dominated the, all of these uh, institutions, the, all the financial and banking institutions. China's challenging all of that. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the uh, United States is responding uh, with fury, and this fury is likely to continue because uh, you, the Americans aren't just going to sit back and say, okay, you go ahead and we're happy to be number two. They've never done it before, and no great power has done it before. So uh, conflict is, uh, is surely in the works. Yeah, okay. I, I, you know, I, I, I hear all of that, and I buy all of that. And, uh, but the thing is that what the United States is doing is converting an economic conflict into uh, a militarized conflict. Uh, we, uh, we have uh, military maneuvers 
on the South China Sea right off of uh, China's coast. Uh, we have been uh, encouraging our allies in the region, uh, even the Vietnamese, uh, to oppose Chinese efforts to uh, uh, claim the Spratly Islands, uh, the deserted, the uh, uh, economically worthless Spratly Islands as part of China. Uh, so, you know, we have been cranking it up and, and, and the underlying threat or the underlying message coming out of our political class is that this is this is a threat to the United States. Yeah, it's not it's not merely that this is a challenger who eventually is going to overtake us if they haven't done so already. And uh, they're, they're, they're turning it into something which it is not. And uh, I believe that very strongly. And I think that the the uh, the media, as usual, is playing the wrong game on this. Uh, every time there is a uh, uh, some complaint from a politician about what China is doing, it's front page news without any context. And, and I think that, that we, you know, it's like we're, we're constantly looking for enemies because when you have a lot of enemies out there, whether it's Russia or China, it, uh, it makes your own shortcomings look like they're a lot less. Well, the, the, the interesting thing, I, I think uh, um, I'm going to fact check you, George. Um, Britain did concede to the United States in oh, surpassing it. Okay, the United States that, is a little different because United there was a special bond between Britain oh, yeah, and the United yeah, States. Special relationship. Okay, we exactly. should do. Yeah. We That's should why do they, one. You know, they could live with that. They couldn't live with Germany. Okay, <laughs> point taken. Um, but Phil, the the issue here in play is that. It, 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 American exceptionalism. This is this is a big problem, okay? Because it, the, the 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 political class is um, um, mentally wired that no one can challenge us. I mean, that is such an ahistorical way of looking at the world, okay? Empires rise and fall. That's the ebb of, of history here, and. <clears throat> An empire that has maturity and vitality can understand those ebbs and flows. Okay, but American exceptionalism is is the um, uh, it, it's a barrier to uh, understanding the realities of how the world is changing. The world is multipolar now. I don't know how many people in think tanks in Washington really want to admit that. Because if you do, then you're kind of out of business because there's what's the purpose of uh, maining superiority constantly all the time. And so it, it's American exceptionalism is going to be a real problem as China continues to rise. And, and unlike uh, past conflicts, this is, an, I, this is a technological one. It's, it, military is there, economic is there, but it's technological. That is the main play, the main issue in this and this growing tension between the U.S. and China. Yeah, te te the, the advance of Chinese technology and more important, the marketing of its technology right. uh, is, is undercutting U.S. markets and it's uh, undercutting U.S. capability even to compete. So I think this is, a, this is a, a reasonable argument to be making, but at the same time, uh, you know, it's a free world as it were. China is free to sell, make what products it wants and sell them to whoever it wants. So are we, so in the United States. But the, 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 I think the underlying issue is you're quite right. You're talking about uh, American exceptionalism. I think the other phrase that I really hate uh, is uh, that we are the leaders of the free world. And, uh, that, yeah. And I wish that, we and could that, retire it. Okay. And we are the ones who are responsible for maintaining the the growth of liberal democracy in the world, which for some reason people see as a, as a plus for everybody. Uh, this is what drives a lot of it. And, it's a, and every time the politicians or the media comes out with these lines, it's a, nobody challenges them. Uh -huh. But it's, more, it's interesting, though, how the, um, the balance of power in the world is going to play out. Um, we knew back in the Cold War, we had this very powerful Soviet Union. The United States aligned itself with China against the Soviet Union. But now, uh, you know, it's one you know, you have all these other powers. You know, wh which way is Russia going to go? Now, Russia is clearly in, uh, in, in the China camp. Um, what about other powers? Who, which camp will India join? India, sort of under, under Modi, seems to be leading towards the United States. Uh, and then again, Japan. So it's interesting 
how this, uh, this balance of power will play out, who will be isolated, because the one who is isolated yeah. will be the one that will be, act dangerously, as happened in the case, obviously, of Germany in 1914. Well, and look, at, and look for example, at the Europeans. The Europeans are not completely on board of, of the American agenda. In fact, far from it. And this has maybe been a gift of Donald Trump that he's been, he's been so abrasive that uh, the Europeans are beginning to look towards their own interests. And, uh, uh, for example, the, the pipeline issue with Germany, uh, the uh, Silk Road, which uh, will be ending up the last I saw in, in northern Italy. Uh, there, are, there are interests that uh, countries have that don't coincide with what the U.S. Uh, direction would like to be on these issues. And uh, uh, I think we're going to see more of that, too. Yeah, the, 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 the Europeans, they're, they're an interesting wild card here because uh, we look at the issue of Iran, uh, we look at the uh, Nord Stream pipeline, good point. I mean, it, 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 you know, it, when there's a crusade, a Western crusade, they're on board, but when it's at their own economic and national interest, then there's a reassessment here. I mean, this whole thing about um, a, a NATO spending. I mean, I truly believe the resistance from NATO members to spend more money is because they know Russia really isn't a threat to them. Okay, I mean, it, it, it's it, it. Trump wants it to drive arms manufacturing, but the Europeans living in austerity and now through this pandemic and economic turndown, they're saying we could spend money for defending ourselves against like poverty and unemployment. I mean, there's a reassessment now of uh, what threatens you in the world, and it's really. It's it's inequality uh, uh, all around the world, and that there is a rejection of neoliberalism all around the world, irrespective of uh, what kind of, uh, of uh, government you have. And we can go from Lebanon to all through South America, inside the United States, um, Brexit, all of this. So I mean, you know, it, it, what's in play here is, is not the traditional world that we got during the unipolar moment. Right. I think that's a that's the fact, and. And the thing is, uh, why it's so hard to sell the, the neoliberal argument or even the neocon arguments about uh, a world of enemies sitting out there uh, is because people um, um, of the newer generations don't think that way anymore. Yeah. Uh, they've been living in a world that, that has been constructed quite differently, uh, certainly since uh, the fall of communism. Uh, we have a world where, where people can travel anywhere, where people from from everywhere are going to everywhere else. Uh, your presence in Moscow, for example, I've been to Russia a couple of times. I mean, it's a, uh, again, it, 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 these experiences are eye openers and, and you, you're not gonna go back to the old uh, ideologue approach to what the world is all about after you but have these experiences. I, I, that's, I think, sure, but there's also the economic nationalist uh, argument because what the um, pandemic showed is the, the danger of economies, European economies, American economy, just being shipped overseas. And so they suddenly found that uh, you're unable to produce the basic necessities to protect yourself against the pandemic because all your supply chains are in China. So this could lead to uh, a, certainly a reaction in the United States, but in Europe as well, hey, that this deindustrialization, this shipping of uh, uh, manufacturing overseas into China isn't really such a good idea. So I think there is there's likely to be some kind of an economic nationalist backlash. Yeah, but I mean, but you have the, 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 there's one little wrinkle in the ointment. There is, is it the the fly in the ointment is is that it was corporate America, corporate Western companies that did this. Right, but, and so will the they have an economic? Yeah, the, government, I mean, the governments could have put pressure. Yeah, no, I agree. But the governments could put pressure on them. I mean, no, remember no. Trump used to put pressure on the corporations that you ship your job overseas, we're going to hit you with taxes when you try to import the stuff back into the United States. So the things that government can do. Okay, gentlemen, we've run out of time here. Philip, thank you very, very much for joining us. Of course, George here. Thank you for joining us here on The Gaggle. Um, please like, share, and subscribe. We're much more ahead.